All right, how's everybody's weekend? Good? All right, um, as the question begs, and I hope my photorealistic emoji drawing works, uh, does anyone have a cornhole setup I could use? This is like a prayer. I already called the rec center. They do not have cornhole. And I know a lot of people were saying we should get cornhole uh, going on Saturday. So no, no one has one? Try and steal one from a frat? I don't know. Uh, also, homework nine, I'm putting it up. I think I just released it. So it's due on the very, very last day of class on Wednesday. Okay, and that's just on Pearson like normal. All right, so as a review of what we were doing. All right, so as a review of what we were doing, we were talking about the efficiency of engines. Okay. So we had our new favorite equation for the efficiency of an engine in terms of how much work it spat out, how much useful work it did. Yeah? Continue talking. Let's get this, uh, let's get this going. Wait, that is the wrong remote. Rut row indeed. Does anyone see where the projector remote is? Yeah, I was gonna say. There we go. We'll just give that a second to warm up. There we are. OK. So we were talking about the efficiency of engines, which was phrased in terms of how much of the energy pulled out of the hot reservoir was outputted as useful work, and the rest was exhausted to the cold reservoir. Okay, so this formula told us the number that was the efficiency of the engine. And we played around with it in a couple ways. We had two equivalent forms of this formula. And we got them by basically using this conservation of energy flow idea from drawing our engine diagrams, which remember, we never skip because it can bite us. Even though it's very easy, it'll enable us to do problems without getting stuck. Okay, uh, okay. for more realistic examples, we would need to find the work output by figuring out the area inside of the curve. And that tells you the total work outputted over an entire cycle. And then we also needed to know the heat being pulled from the hot reservoir or the heat being inputted to the cold reservoir. And then we could draw the diagram and figure out, like I have in red here, how much heat was being pulled from the hot reservoir. Something I don't think I was very clear on last time that I want to really hammer through. OK. Along each process in an engine, like an engine is going to be composed of two to four processes going around in a cycle, each process will have either heat inflow or heat exhaust. OK, so presumably in this diagram, two processes, the upwards and rightwards one will have heat inflow. And in this case, the problem directly told us there is heat outflow along the down and left processes. What I want to be very careful about explaining is that when you are asked for like Q cold, you look at all the heats 
and you only add up the ones that are heat outputs. Okay? Q cold is not the total up of all the heats around the cycle or something like that. These two heats would compose Q hot because it's being pulled from the hot reservoir into the gas. So if you were asked for Q hot, you would just add up those two red arrows that I circled. You don't touch the outputs. And if you were asked what is Q cold for this engine, you only total up the sizes of these two arrows, and that would be Q cold. You don't do anything with the processes where there's heat inflow. Okay, so we have to consider each process pretty separately and figure out along if, sorry, if we have to figure out if along each process it was a heat input or output to know if we should include that as part of Q cold or Q hot. Okay, any, any questions on that? It can be pretty confusing. You're just not, you're not totaling up all the heats. You have to do each process separately and determine whether it's part of the exhaust processes or the heat stealing from the hot reservoir processes. Okay, so as promised, we were gonna start class with sort of the worst case scenario example with everything that could go wrong in a heat engine which isn't that much worse than this. The only thing that we didn't have spoon-fed to us in this problem was they told us Q1 and Q2, the heat outputs on two processes. We have calculated in class already multiple times how much heat is outputted during this isobaric process or this isochoric process or whatever. So you actually know how to do it. So we've already done everything, but I wanna put it all together in an example. So, Here's our worst case scenario. There's a ton of text, don't write it down. I'm gonna explain it and then walk you through it. Okay. Got myself there. Come on. Something bad is happening. My mouse is uh, <laughs> lagging substantially. There we go. Okay, so there's a lot of words here. I probably should have taken a pedagogy course and learned to not write that crap. All right, so just as a reminder, we are looking for work and Q hot. That is what we're gonna need to compute the efficiency, which is the end of this problem, okay? We need work and we need Q hot. Work is easy because it's the area inside of that shape. Okay, so work is done. All we need is Q hot. So to do Q hot, since it's not told to us where is the heat inputs, where are the heat outputs, we need to consider each process separately and figure out how much Q was inputted. Okay? So to do that, we're going to need to figure out where the corners of the graph are first. That is step one, okay? So step one is we are told P and V along each leg of a cycle, and we need to find either like the temperature or the number of moles, whichever one is not told to us. And just really quickly, I wanna check something here. Sorry, this is, this is supposed to say two moles of gas are used for this. I say it on the next slide. Okay, so for step one, we're going to figure out what the temperature is at each of the three points. We'll need that later in the first law. Okay, general strategy, the next step is once we have those temperatures, we're gonna make a table of each of the three processes, one to two, two to three, and then three to one and we're gonna write down what is the work done along the process, and also what is the delta E thermal, right, NC delta T, along each process. And from that, we'll get the heat along each process. As soon as we have the heat along each process, the problem is essentially done. Okay, so I'm gonna move slides. This will be just shrunken down so I have space to work. computer is not having it today. All right, so we have two moles of a monoatomic gas. We'll need that for a specific heat. 
This should be smaller. Okay, so our first step is we're going to determine the temperature at each of the three corners using the ideal gas law. Okay, so use ideal gas law, which is T equals PV over NR. And this is true at any instant along the cycle. We're going to use it at the corners. Okay, I'm just going to tell you the results. T1 is 602 Kelvin. This is 1203 Kelvin. And T2 is 1805 Kelvin. Write that bigger. Sorry, I, this slide will be have a little small text. So if people in the back need some readouts, it's 1805 in the top corner, 1203 in the right corner and 602 in the bottom left. Okay, and I'm gonna start making my table. So for process one to two, I'm gonna have a column. For two to three, woo. For two to three, I'm gonna have a column. And then for three to one, I'm gonna have a column. Okay, and for each process, I need to know the delta E thermal. And remember, this is always equal to N C V delta T. I will want to know the work output, which will be either positive P delta V or positive integral of P delta V, or the area if it's a straight line. Okay, and then at the end of my table, I'm going to write Q equals delta E thermal plus work out. I'll let you guys copy that table down. Okay, the reason my first law looks flipped, usually it's delta E equals Q minus W. Or sorry, sorry, usually it's delta E equals Q plus W, so it's like, shouldn't I have a minus sign? Remember, work in and work out are the negatives of each other. And for engines, we care about the work outputted along each process. So I'll let you guys copy down. I know it's a complicated diagram plus table. <laughs> plus. Again, we're concerned about each process individually because at the end of the day, what we need is that bottom row. We need to know if each process had heat input or output to determine where the heat was being taken from. And to get Q, you always need to use the first law. It's the only equation with a Q in it. Does anybody want more time to copy down the table? Okay. So I have all the temperatures. I know everything about the gas at every point. So let's just go down the table. So delta E thermal is always equal to NCV delta T. Remember, there was all that BS with Q equals NCP delta T. This equation is always true, right? I think I wrote that on slides a couple days ago. This equation is always true. No matter what kind of process, if it was isochoric, isobaric, adiabatic, it doesn't matter. Okay, so T1 to T2. Okay, I have two moles of gas, so I know N. For a monoatomic gas, CV equals three halves the gas constant. Right, that's a secret step of information that you guys will sometimes forget. 
if it were oxygen gas being used in the engine, it would be a diatomic gas, so you would use five halves R. So I know N, I know CV, and I know the temperature at the beginning and end. So I can plug all those numbers in, and I will get 30,000 joules for delta E thermal. If I do the same thing for two and three, being very careful that I am correctly identifying final temperature minus initial temperature, I'll get minus 15,000, oops, minus 15,000 for two to three, and also coincidentally minus 15,000 for three to one. And this is good because as I go around a whole cycle, the temperature returns to its original value. So I like that all the delta E's add up to zero. Okay, next, let's get the work out. So process one to two is gonna be the area under this red triangle plus the area under this blue triangle, or sorry, this, uh, the area of this blue rectangle, okay? And again, it's not negative area because we're talking about work output here. If it were work into the gas, it would be negative of the area. But since it's not, it's work output, we're doing the positive area. And if you total up those areas, you'll get 12,500. Okay, uh, two to three is a vertical line. There's no like width of that line. Like integral of PDV is zero. So there's no work done. It's an isochoric process. Okay, and three back to one. This graph is going right to left. So PDV gives us a negative number out. And the size of that number is 12,500. So negative 12,500 is the, oops, sorry, sorry, negative 10,000 is the area of the blue rectangle. Okay, now we can get Q for each process. We know the delta E thermal for every process, we know the work out for every process, and this equation, which is just the first law, remember, says we can just add them together. So Q in for this first process is 42,500. For the middle process, it's negative 15,000, and for the last process, it's negative 25,000. Okay, so we have done steps two, or one, I suppose, two, three, and four. I suppose we've done most of four. I'm gonna draw an engine diagram now just to make sure that everything makes sense. There's a lot of opportunities for mistakes and I just wanna make sure everything makes sense. I'll do it in colors. Here's our hot reservoir, our cold reservoir, and our work output. Okay, which things are heat inputs into the gas? That first process required 42,500 joules of heat to be injected into the gas. That came from the hot reservoir. So this red arrow is gonna be 42,500. Process two to three and three to one both gave off heat to the environment as exhaust and totaled up, they exhausted 40,000 joules of heat. Okay, the total work output, it outputted 12,500 along one to two, but then it required the environment to do 10,000 back to return it to its initial state during three to one. So the work output was 2,500 joules overall. 
And if we did everything right from our table, we should see like the energy split up make sense. Right? We had 42,500. 2,500 was used as work, and the other 40,000 was wasted as exhaust. Okay, so we know we did everything right, probably, because all of our numbers add up and make a sensible energy flow diagram. Okay, and number six somehow got put into number five. So, eta is work out over Q hot. In this case, we found 2,500 out for work and 4,500 for Q hot, which gives us an efficiency of 0 0.059, or about 6%. Typical engines will be somewhere between 5% and 30%, 40%. Okay, questions on the problem solving process here? Again, it was mostly an organizational challenge. Yes? Uh, sorry, say one more time. Where do I get the work out? Yeah, so f to get work out for each process, I'll find the area under the graph, if they're straight lines, at least. And in this case, we got lucky and they were all straight lines. Um, if it's not a straight line, you might have to do like a more detailed, like you might have to do an integration if you're told the equation of the line, but w I don't think we're gonna do that. Awesome, okay, so, yes? Yeah, so his question was, like, was it a coincidence that these three numbers added up to zero? And the answer is no. Delta E thermal around a whole cycle, you always return to the initial temperature. So over the entire cycle, all the delta E thermals had better add up to zero because delta T has come back to its original value. Or sorry, T has come back to its original value. So delta T will be zero. Uh, Simon, do you have a question? Or? Yeah, so his question was, how, how do I know which one is heat in and which ones are heat out as exhaust? So I'm reading that off from the sign of the number in the very bottom. Any process that had positive Q in required heat input from like the heat storage area, which is the hot reservoir. And anything where there was negative heat in, that's like heat being exhausted out, you just sort of know that that is going to the cold reservoir. So those with negative numbers are Q cold contributions, and those with positive numbers are Q hot contributions. Yes? Uh, like the temperatures? Yeah, so for the temperatures, I use that like emergency process of, oops, of apply the ideal gas law at each corner. Since I was told, sorry, my computer is not responding to my mouse or sorry, to the pen. So I was told the number of moles, and at each corner I know exactly the pressure and the volume from the graph. So I know three of P, V, N, and T. So I just plug everything into the ideal gas law at each point and get the temperature at each corner. No, no, to get the, to get the temperatures was the very, very first thing I did before I even drew the table. Like, I just, I just looked at the graphs and... Oh, 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 sorry, okay, so her question was actually for drawing the engine diagram, is what you're asking about? Yeah, so I pulled these from the bottom, or, okay, I pulled some of them from the last row of the table and some from the work row. So, the way I got the 42,500 was I looked for what processes are uh, requiring heat input. So, in this case, this number right here was positive, so I knew that had to be coming from the hot reservoir. These two numbers, totaling up to 40,000, were like exhaust heat, so I knew they had to be going to the cold reservoir. And then the only mystery is where did the 2,500 come from, and you total up all the numbers in this second row for all the net work that's done over the cycle. And you should check that it makes a sensible diagram. I technically could have gotten the 2,500 by cheating and subtracting 40,000, but 
that would eliminate my safety check. All right, so you guys will work through this exact problem on the homework with one mole of gas. Um, again, just keep your wits about you and stay organized. Okay, so we're now going to talk about refrigerators and then the ideal heat engine. So as I mentioned at the beginning, it's kind of non-intuitive, but engines are perfectly reversible by design. Their entropy change is zero. Therefore, if you take the energy that the engine outputted and you stuff it back in in reverse, you can make the gas do the opposite direction process. Okay, so if I draw us a diagram here of our hot reservoir and our cold reservoir, you can put work in to move heat from the cold reservoir. This time heat is coming out of the cold reservoir. You're sucking extra excess heat to cool it off and putting it into the hot reservoir, making the hot reservoir even hotter. Obviously, the blue would be your actual refrigerator in your house. You remove heat from the refrigerator and exhaust it into the room. That's why if you've ever walked behind a refrigerator, it's so warm, because it's the exhaust outlet. Okay, so our slogan will be you use work to move heat from cold to hot. Reservoir. Okay, this doesn't violate the second law because it's not spontaneous. You have to spend a lot of energy to do it. Okay, we're back to work in now, because for refrigerators, you care about how much power does it take to run the refrigerator, rather than how much power output is an engine doing. So conservation of energy of this diagram still works. Work in plus Q cold. Still equals, okay, I shouldn't say still equals. This is a different equation than before, because we have the heat's moving in different directions and work in instead of work out. So the signs are all over the place. But if you draw the diagram, you won't ever go wrong. Okay, and there's something called the coefficient of performance. Uh, often it's abbreviated COP for a refrigerator. The symbol is K, and it's sort of like the efficiency of the refrigerator, except it is Q cold over work in, which is kind of a weird definition. And I'll close the box. Now, obviously, just like before, if instead you're told Q hot and work in, you should draw the diagram, find Q cold using the diagram, and then plug into this equation. Obviously, there are equivalent forms which are the same as doing that, where you can replace Q cold in this equation with Q hot minus work. Um, but I think it's just easier if you draw the diagram. Okay, so we're going to do a quick example on coefficient of performance here. Okay. All right, so here I tell you the number of work input. 
I tell you the coefficient of performance, and I ask you various questions about heat flow from the reservoirs. All right, and this is problem 21.5 on your homework, so you are investing in your future by doing it now. And as usual, ask questions because refrigerators can be confusing with all the sign conventions. All right, so how much heat is extracted from the cold reservoir per cycle? So K is told to us to be five. Okay, so K is five. Work in is told to us to be 45. So move 45 to the other side, multiply them. So Q cold equals 225 joules. Okay, so if I now draw a diagram, I have this picture. 225 is being 
taken out of the refrigerator to make it even colder. 45 joules of work is being inputted to accomplish this. And that energy combines and all flows to the hot reservoir for a total of 270 joules to the hot reservoir as exhaust in this case. Okay. Questions on this? This is a direct analog of an efficiency problem for an engine where you find one thing by multiplying eta by whatever was in the denominator and then draw the diagram to finish. All right, so we'll move on to the last topic of the day, which is the ideal engine. Okay, so a while ago we had eta can't ever be greater than one. And actually, coefficient of performance, I didn't tell you this, um, but kappa, rain, or k, coefficient of performance, can go up to infinity just due to the fact that it's defined differently as like a reciprocal. Um, but so these were like sort of weird limits we had. But it turns out there's even stronger constraints. Like it, it, the situation's even worse for the efficiency of these things. OK, so it turns out eta is going to be less than like 0.9 or 0.7. You can't even get close to one. And the reason is that if you were to pair, and this diagram's kind of small, but it is on the slides uploaded. If you were to pair a perfect heat engine, okay, with efficiency one, with a refrigerator, you would be able to cause heat flow from a cold object to a hot object with no net external work input, okay? And that would violate the second law of thermodynamics. So it would cause issue. Spontaneous heat flow, cold to hot, which is not allowed by the second law. That says spontaneous heat flow from cold to hot. And again, the issue is only revealed if you do like a complicated thought experiment where you combine an engine with a refrigerator. Okay, so people designed as good of an engine as they could called the Carnot engine, which just barely does not violate the second law. It keeps the heat just barely not flowing backwards. Okay, and it's called the Carnot cycle. It's a very specific set of processes that you take a gas through that you calculate the efficiency like we did in our example, and it turns out to be the theoretical maximum. Okay, now, we had this formula for efficiency that worked for any engine, which was eta equals work out over Q hot. Oops, sorry. Work out over Q hot. And then using conservation of energy, we simplified it to 1 minus Q cold over Q hot. Now, this works for any engine to tell you its efficiency in terms of how much work it does. Okay, so th this is for any engine. Okay, for the Carnot cycle specifically, you can compute what Q hot and Q cold are when you do that diagram we just did on the cycle. And it turns out for the Carnot cycle specifically, it turns out that you compute Q cold over Q hot, and it's actually equal to um, T cold over T hot. Okay, we haven't ever seen this before. Like, usually efficiency is about heat flow in and out, but if you compute what is Q cold over Q hot for a Carnot engine going between two specific reservoirs, it turns out that number is actually related to the temperatures of the reservoirs. So I'm going to call this eta max. Okay, and this is for a Carnot engine only.
and no actual engine's eta can ever be higher than this number. If someone tells you they made an engine and it has efficiency at these given temperatures of 0.9 and a Carnot engine only has 0.8 efficiency, they're lying. It's theoretically impossible. Sorry, this formula belongs down here where there's more space. Okay, again, these formulas on the left, they work for absolutely any engine to tell you its efficiency, or once you know its efficiency to find Q hot and Q cold. This formula on the right tells you how efficient a Carnot engine is, end of story. You can't use this formula on the right with T cold over T hot for anything else. It's only good for one thing. How efficient is a Carnot engine between these two temperatures? And there's an analog of this for the fridge. If you run the fridge in, re or sorry, if you run the Carnot engine in reverse, you draw our table, you write out what is Q in along each leg. You can replace our friendly fridge equation, which was our friendly fridge equation was Q cold over work in. This was valid for any fridge. And for the Carnot fridge only, you can compute what they are in terms of the temperatures of the reservoirs, and you get that K max equals T cold over T hot minus T cold. Again, usually you talk about efficiency in terms of the actual heat outputs and work outputs or work inputs. And you can do that for any fridge at all. And in the specific case of a Carnot fridge, those heats are determined in terms of the temperatures by doing some gross algebra, which we did a couple slides ago. And no fridge can have a coefficient of performance higher than this number. So a typical problem involving Carnot engines or Carnot fridges will be something like an engine operating between 200 Celsius reservoir and a 100 Celsius reservoir has one half of the ideal efficiency. Find random stuff about it. The way you want to do the problem is find out what the ideal efficiency would have been. Maybe it equals 0.7 then you know your engine actually has an efficiency of 0.35. And then you can finish the problem just as easily as all the other ones we've done before. It becomes an easy problem. Okay, so let's do one example to wrap up class on that, on comparison to the ideal engine. So exactly as promised, I tell you the temperatures of the reservoirs in Celsius. You need to work in Kelvin. I'm actually going to go back and write that on the slide. Kelvin, Kevin, yeah. Okay, so I tell you the temperatures of the reservoirs. You should find the maximum efficiency, multiply by one third to get your actual efficiency, and then finish the problem. All right, I will tune back in in about three or four minutes to write the solution out.
kind of have to hustle to finish up here. So I computed the maximum possible efficiency between the two temperatures. I got 0.653, but that's not your ITA. Your engine isn't perfect. It's only 33% that efficient. So I multiplied that ideal efficiency by 33% to get the actual ITA. Okay. Now ITA is work out divided by Q hot. We know eta, we know work out. That gives us Q hot. Okay, so Q hot is 46, 41 joules. Work out is 1,000. And if you were asked about Q cold, you could use conservation of energy to get it too. Sorry, I had to jump the gun. All right, it's 110 now, so I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Come up to me if you have questions on this. I know I had to fly through it, kind of.